Okay. It looks like I might be live. It just kept kicking over and ending, but I guess I'm live now. Okay, good. Um, today I'm just doing a bunch of axe work. I can kind of see questions, so I'll keep my eyes peeled. And if you have any questions, go ahead and shout them out. In the meantime, <clears throat> I'll just be working. There's a stone wall right over here, and I can hear a mouse rustling around in it. <clears throat> Something it sounds like a mouse, chipmunk, rustling around in the stones and the probably figuring out some dry leaves or something. Uh, which axe do I have? Uh, this is a Granfors Bruck uh, Swedish carving axe, large Swedish carving axe. It's the kind with the uh, symmetrical bevel. So I'm a lefty. Righties can use it just as easily. Um, that's the axe that I have. You hear the rooster in the background. Today is actually a quiet day. Um, they've been doing a lot of work on the barn. The new barn across the road, trying to get it ready for an, uh, some event that they're doing there. So as you can see, I do um, I do the crank first, and then I draw the shape that I want on that crank face. And that way I can quite easily tell if I've got enough width in the blank down here for what I intend to do. That lets me adjust that outline of the spoon with the full knowledge of whether it's going to work or not within what I have available for the wood. So it tends to look like that. These are blanks for someone in Louisiana and I'm going to do some other blanks uh, two other people today. I can't remember where they're from. But probably a total of 45 blanks in the next, I don't know, four or five hours. Some of them are raw blanks, so uh, no more than, than this. And so they're, they're quite fast to make. Some are finished blanks, so all this additional axe work that I'm doing. So I should be able to get 45 done over the course of the next couple of hours. It's always nice when your stop cuts work out in the back there. So this is that silky saw with the real aggressive teeth that I was complaining about a couple months ago. And what I found is as the saw has gotten dull, because I, I've used it pretty much exclusively for the last month, um, the teeth uh, engage better on a soft cut. Um, and, it's, and it's become much more of a pleasure to use. So, So this is what I was talking about with the Spoonosaurus thing, was it yesterday? That if you don't have enough force right here to get that to pop off, um, then you end up getting too close to either this line here or down to the shoulder here without getting it to pop off. So the real, the genius of this technique is that you're using enough force that there's kind of a shock wave sent through the wood that pushes and pops that tip of wood free. Now up here, further up, I'm not asking it to do that, but in those initial ones down low, close to the next, you wanna be using enough force that it pops like that. That's really important.
And then as I get down closer to the bottom here, I'm making sure that my my cut doesn't follow through, that there's there's a hard stop, almost a snap to where it ends. And that keeps me from over cutting. Um, one of my goals for when I'm at Greenwood Fest is to uh, learn a bunch of different ways of doing spoon blanks from other people and really see if I can get people to lay out for me why, you know, why they do things in the order of operations that they do so that I can learn them and, and really articulate them to other people as well. Because I'm sure every approach has its advantages and disadvantages and there's, a, there's an internal logic to why you do things in a certain way, in a certain order. And that's something I'm looking forward to finding more out. It's certainly it's something that I think about a lot with my own process is what's the, what's the internal logic to doing it the way that I do it. Because while my own process has evolved over the years, I have never set out to learn someone else's process from start to finish. Um, you know, deliberately to the point where I could just do it myself and explain the differences. Um, so that's a further step I'm looking forward to being able to, to take. Okay, cooking spoon blank. Less crank on the cooking spoons than on an eater. Is what I found works nicely. Um, let's see. I'm gonna do just a small, small scoop blank out of this one. One of the nice things about using really big logs is that you can kind of split them up any number of ways and get a really interesting variety of grain orientations. Out of the one log. With smaller logs, it sort of you end up either doing radial or split them in half. With big logs, you can kind of have a little this way, a little that way. So you can see in this orientation, it's going to be uh, it's just going to be an interesting mix. Although this one is going to be mostly tangential, um, just because I need the the width of sort of cocking it on its side. Any questions? It's finally a gorgeous day out. It's about 60 degrees outside. The sun just came out. I'm in the shade, but I can see the sun, and it's really just about as nice as can be. So one thing I found is almost everybody skews from one side or the other and cuts in more on one side than on the other. So for me, it's uh, I tend to cut in more on this side. And that just has to do with where my axe is cutting and where it's where it's not cutting. And so when I'm coming in from either direction, it'll be cut in more on this side and then more on this side. And I need to go back and if I don't want my blank to be twisted, I go back and make sure I correct for that as much as is reasonable. Trying to take as much of the twist out of that rim as I can before I draw the shape. So usually I try and do, um, yeah, nice with those birds, right? Um, usually I try and do 
scoops as part of a larger uh, blank, and I'll do it first, and that gives me a longer piece to hold on to. And this is just an off cut, so. <clears throat> the tricky part is doing these stop cuts when you only have a little bit to hold on to. So I made myself a little bit of a flat bottom there. And uh, this one's actually pretty easy to hold on to. I myself am attracted to simple shapes, so I tend to, when people ask for blanks, I tend to give them simple shapes. You know, somebody who asks for uh, a whole bunch of eaters, I will often try and give them a bunch of different eater forms, unless there's someone that I know is try trying to sort of master one, one form through repetition. Um, so I do try and tailor my blanks to the person and what I know of their goals. But, uh, but usually the blanks will look like a sort of spoon that I would carve. And I do use the blanks as a, as a process of exploring new shapes that I don't necessarily carve much myself. It's a combination of old shapes and new shapes. But some things like, uh, you know, like this scoop are just, they're just so easy to carve and delightful. Um, hi everybody. Let's see here. Okay. So, with the scoops, you got to be real gentle when you tap off the sides here. It's easy to go too far and really wail down into the body of the, the back of the, the scoop there. And then, See? Yeah, you can see. With scoops, and particularly mini scoops, you gotta be real careful because they're so short that you're always working near your hands. So you just have to be very gentle and um, just make sure that you're staying away from your hands as much as you possibly can. And just just got a little bit of split wood here. I gotta remove that, see what I'm working with. So gentle and, and just generally making sure that the ax never goes up above your hand. And the closer you are working to your hand, the more gentle you are. See how gentle those cuts are. Real close to my fingers like that. Super quiet and gentle. have it. I try to keep with my blanks a certain amount of meatiness to them um, so that if you're carving and you make a mistake there's some wiggle room so that you can continue even 
if you feel like something went wrong. So with a big block of wood like this, if there's a big wavy thing, I'll probably try and split it such that I'd split off a piece that has the wavy bit within it rather than try and split down through the middle of the wavy bit. So you'll see me splitting like this. And that way I can sort of get out from under that waviness and the rest of the big chunk of wood will be clear. Close to the tripod. Hi Joseph. So you can see this is the back side of the part that was so wavy there. So now the nice thing is that if this is the top of the spoons, then um, this back part will be mostly cut off and trimming down the back of the handles. So that makes it very easy. Um. Yeah, so I'll do, this is a nice long piece of wood. I try, if I can, to do cherry logs um, that I'm harvesting off of the trees long enough that I can fit a scoop and then a cooking spoon, or at least an eater, but often a cooking spoon, depending on what's going on. And that way I can do my scoops still attached to a larger piece of wood. So again, as I'm up here close to my, my finger here, very gentle so that the ax doesn't come down on my thumb and everything's tucked back to the side. But this is great. Now I can do this. I say it's amazing how all the practice I've had doing round shapes, I can now do a much more accurate job drawing a round shape than I was able to before. Hmm. Sometimes the nicest shapes come down to very subtle things. So part of what makes this so nice is it's not an actual, it's not a curve that's following. Uh, if I was to do a curve that would sort of make a sweepy curve, it would come in like this. It wouldn't look so nice. That being said, if I were to go out any further, then it would look like I should have an intentional notch. But this somehow manages to follow that. It like comes out just a little bit and then goes straight. And to my eye, that looks really pleasing. Um, now, will whoever gets this blank actually follow that line? Who knows? But the, the beauty of making these blanks for other people is that I get to explore that relationship of those lines, even if I'm not going to be the one actually carving the scoop. It's you know sort of practice for me in drawing these shapes and seeing these shapes as much as it is practice for other people in, in carving whatever it is that they carve from these. So this is that cut that I do that's it's uh, still in the same thing it's just turning it 180 degrees and it allows me to do that back side while still having the wood firmly braced like this and uh, it's actually a fairly easy cut even though it looks awkward
Okay. You don't see it, but I have a little bench over here that I put good pieces of wood on. Keeps them up off the ground because this ground is real easy to lose track of what's there. Um, Guys, I'm reading this fantastic book right now by Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, uh, which is probably how most of you have heard of her, but she also wrote this great novel called The Last American Man back in the, back around 2000, something like that. At any rate, this book is her latest book. It's called Big Magic, and it's all about uh, the creative process. In her case, it's about being a writer, but... You know, it's, 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 you can extrapolate. She does a good job of making sure that you can extrapolate from that into any creative process. And I have to say, I'm finding this book really satisfying to read in many ways. She, uh, she covers a lot of the things that we as a community talk about and just has some really nice perspectives on them. Um, and so, you know, things like originality and, people's reactions to your work, um, your own permission, giving yourself permission to do something. Um, yeah, she just has, does a really nice job with it. So if any of you are looking for a next good book to read, it's very easy to read, well-written. Um, I'm not going to say it's light because that, that implies that it's frivolous, but it, it's light in the sense that it's just super easy to read. Um, but I've been getting a lot out of it, so but you guys might like to know. I've always really enjoyed Elizabeth Gilbert. If you've never read any of her novels, one of my favorite novelists. Um, blank. Okay, here's the second half of that. And like I said, the, the wavy part that I was avoiding is there, so I'll make this the top half, and then the wavy part will just get uh, totally removed. Now, I could probably squeak an, a cooking spoon out of this, but I know this person is going to want some eaters, so... Now, a good eater, in my mind, has a little more crank than a cooking spoon or a scoop. So you can see I'm going fairly deep there. Now, if you don't do this next step, you end up with basically a spoon that has a false crank. With It looks like it has a crank because this angle here, but it, the whole spoon itself is actually drooped down below the angle of the handle. So instead, what you got to do is bring that top plane of the handle down to this valley also. And that creates the fundamental relationship of the crank, which is the difference the difference in angle between the handle and the rim of the bowl. Which is what I have here. Rim of the bowl, handle. And there was a spot right here where I came up and, and hit the grain, so I'm just going to Come down this face one more time and remove that so it doesn't surprise me later on. Good, just like that. Now I can see how much I have. You can see I actually put the wavy bit right at the, the back of the bowl there because the back of the bowl is a round surface. And if there's any that remains in terms of the grain being a little squirrely, it's easier to deal with it in the round surface of the bowl. So I draw my shape. As always, I find 
Some of my favorite shapes are just classic egg shaped like that. And, uh, and this is the lowest part right here. Very important. Now this, I'm gonna draw it in circles so you can see it clearly. So the straight line is the lowest part. The circled line right here is the widest part of the bowl. Now it's super important to have the widest part of the bowl up further than the lowest part because that means that as you're cutting this rim, you can come down the rim and then by the time you hit that lowest part where the grain changes, you're actually going downhill this way. And you can do this cut in one motion and you won't get stuck here down at the lowest part going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth trying to clean it up. So most important thing is to get that widest part of the bowl up above the deepest part of the crank. For me, that usually works out to having about four-fifths above the crank and one-fifth, just the back shoulder back behind the crank. And that will make it a lot easier to not get stuck in that valley trying to resolve that situation. Now, one of the things I think is really important is being able to, in a, in a spoon blank, to draw a shape that's big enough, that has the right lines, but that's big enough that you can, um, you have something to carve away to achieve the final dimensions. And the final dimensions are what you want. You're not so big that you've got a lot of carving to do, but you haven't drawn the shape that is like the actual finished shape and size that you want. You have to draw it like a shade bigger so that you end up in the right place because wood carving is, is in a, a subtractive art. I've been uh, finding myself angling more recently towards slightly wider, slightly shallower bowls that have uh, basically um, just the tiniest of rim at the, at the mouth and that taper from the thickest part being the deepest part to the thinnest part being the rim. And they just pop right out of your mouth um, in a way that is just delightful. If anyone has any questions, feel free. I can see the screen pretty well. So here I'm just a shade narrower on the back than I am in the front. And that's okay because I've got so much thickness here that by the time I reduce this by half, I'll be back to this being just the right amount of width. Um, so it's okay in this instance. This little bench to my side here is also great for my, my club to sit, uh -huh, that's not a great example, sit upright so that I can just grab for it down here and, and use it without having to stoop over and pick it up on the ground. So sometimes you get real close to the line like that, and other times you're further away. Usually, the way wood splits is it, it tends to run out on the narrow side. So if you have more material over here and less material on this side of a split, it'll always run towards the outside of a split. So as long as your blank is, is narrower, how to describe this? So as long as your blank is narrow enough that your handle takes up enough room that the part to the side of it is narrower, then the handle part, then it will tend to run towards the outside, which is what you want. So I guess that's a, that's a reason to take the time to get your, your blank split down to the width that is pretty closely approximating the, the final width of the bowl, because that will allow you to split off the sides of the handle and have them reliably run out the way that you can. Another thing I like doing here is 
when I do this, I'll make this get narrower and narrower and narrower. But because I'm not right to that rim, then watch what happens. As soon as I then go around, it widens up again to that width that I want to maintain along the sides there. So again, my initial split keeps me back a little bit. And then I make some cuts with that curve and get real close to that corner. Bring it down to almost nothing. And then when I go around the corner, it widens up again. And that's one way that I achieve the, the size rim that I'm shooting for. Very little back and forth by anticipating that it's going to widen up like that. So one thing I found is it's always good to hold on to this loosely enough that if for some reason the axe catches that it'll fling it away from you. What you don't want to be doing is holding on to it so tightly that if the axe catches, the axe pops out and then you've got momentum coming down on your hand. So it's better to look like an idiot and pick up a blank that popped free from you than to look like an idiot because you were holding on so tightly to your blank that you ended up hitting yourself in your own hand by accident. So again, just knocking down these corners, very thin, and then I go around them, around the outline in a 90 degree plane, and you can see it widens back out again. Now here, um, uh, let's see, can you see this bit? So here, I'm supporting the spoon on the corner of the stump, And that really, that little bit round in that corner saves a lot of wear and tear on the knife edge. Um, that's one of the hardest things on the knife is when you're trying to twist and twist and twist to, to make that cut in that corner. So the more you can remove that material, the better. Okay. There's an eater. And... Why not? This one is going to be sort of maybe a cooking spatula. Uh, let's see, I guess I'll tilt it up so I can see your comments again. Um, there is a relationship between these two cuts that's important. If, with the exception of a scoop, where all I do is just come in equally from one side and then the other side, but if with this one you do your, your bowl cut and then your stop cut is too shallow, um, what ends up happening is it ends up creeping up and making your bowl shorter and shorter and shorter, um, even as you keep cleaning up this bowl face. Uh, and that's important because you want a bunch of the bowl to be up here and then just the last fifth to be down there. So I skip making a square build at first. Is that a thing of experience? That's, yeah, so um, so I do that just because uh, I guess you need to have the experience to look at a piece of wood and say, okay, this if I cut this crank into the face, there will be enough material there. But the other nice thing about it is Sometimes I can get away with stuff within a billet because I haven't taken the time to make it square and that there's, you know, maybe a little bit of wood protruding at the bottom that's just enough to give me enough belly to the bowl. And if I squared it up beforehand, well, then I wouldn't have the material there. So it does allow me to make the most uh, of a particular piece of wood. And I guess that understanding comes from experience. Like, for instance, here I'm seeing that... Um, if I want to maintain the height of the crank here, well, that limits how big of a piece I can do. And I 
don't think I want to do a cooking spatula with this. This cooking spatula would need an extra half inch. And so, um, and so I'm going to do a serving spoon because that takes up just a little bit less room. It's, it's not very analytical. The whole thing just sort of happens with a flow where I'll be, I'll be working and I'll just kind of adjust what I'm doing based on the reality at hand. And that keeps me from getting stuck in with one vision of what I'm doing. I mean, it's the hardest thing to do is to set out to make one particular thing um, and to succeed right away. Uh, I, I do it every day when I set out to make spoons, but um, if I'm making blanks, it's it's a lot easier to sort of let the reality of the of the wood dictate to some extent whether it's going to work out as the blank I originally thought it was going to. Um, but yeah, I mean, then you, so then that also saves a tremendous amount of time not having to true up these sides, which ultimately are just going to get cut and split away. Um, hi Daniel. Uh, so yeah, so not truing up the billet, particularly since I like to have, you know, all I, like I like to have that extra bit to keep my hands safe. So truing up that is just completely wasted effort. So, um, by doing that crank face, the top face, the reference face of the spoon first, it keeps me from having to do any truing up of the billet. Um, Did that make sense? And and did that answer your question? Oh, I'm losing my pen on the air. There we go. Okay. I've come to really like this serving spoon style. It's basically just a, uh, a, an eating spoon where everything is scaled up, but I like to do it with long sort of rows of facets along the handle. It just feels fantastic in the hand. And I just find that larger egg shape to be an excellent serving spoon style because you tend to be coming in at an angle like this, and that, that, that works great. Um... So, and you can see by making the crank first, I can tell that I have enough within this billet, no matter, even, even with what's going on in the back here, that I have enough in here. I can feel it and see it for the curvature that I'm going for without having to have a huge amount of wood. I can just tell that it's in all the places I need it to be in. And so then I can ignore the noise of what's happening back here where it's, you know, I don't need nearly as much but it's there anyways, but it, it doesn't matter one way or the other. So when you're doing these uh, cuts along the neck, it's really important to tip the spoon over to the side. Um, if you try doing it straight up and down, the weight of your blade is gonna wanna twist your blade this way and the cuts are always gonna pop out and start running down running down this way and you'll end up hitting the shoulder. So by leaning the spoon over on the side, the ax can be truly straight up and down and still angled down the way you need it to be to avoid the shoulder. And again, having sufficient force that you're popping material free rather than just carving it with the ax is key. As is, I suppose, making sure that the handle lines up with the grain nicely enough that it can do that. Okay. Let's see here. Good. There was a little crack that I was making sure I had eliminated. My whole process is really trying to front load as much of the failure right at the beginning. So if if a spoon isn't going to work out, I want to know in the first five minutes um, that that crack that I thought was maybe going to be an issue. I want to know if it's an issue right away so that I don't waste a whole bunch of time on something that doesn't work out. So I tend to just run right at whatever looks like it's going to be an issue. I'll run right at it. So I have a process, but if there was like a big crack back here that I wasn't sure about, you can be sure that I'd carve that first 
just to see if it was going to be a problem and that way I could abandon ship quickly if it looked like it was. All right. Now as you can see there's just the right amount for that bowl in there. It's always shocking how little material you need in a bowl of a spoon to uh, have a nice shapely curved spoon. You just need it in the right places. So making sure that you have it in the right places is key. And with these serving spoons, I like to leave the neck a little bit deep so that I can go real narrow and then have it thick enough that you can mess around with fasts and stuff. Um, hey Tucker. Um, part of having the neck be narrow is leaving this nice and wide as it flares up rather than uh, removing this material at the back of the bowl. Um, There we have it. Okay. So now I have the remaining piece of wood and that doesn't have really any wiggle in it at all. So if there's a bit of a wiggle here, which I could use to exaggerate the crank and get a little more natural curvature into my spoon. So I'll do that next. You'll notice that I'm standing off to the side, so when this axe comes through, it's not going anywhere near my body if it does. It doesn't always come through, but I just want, it's just second nature to get out of the way. It's me hitting the ceiling of the woodshed. This cherry is very sweetly behaved. I'm really loving it. Okay, so these pieces are wide enough that I could do, Tucker, how many blanks can I usually axe out in a day? Um, well, today I'm doing 45. Uh, I think the most I've done is maybe 60. That was a long day. I was tired at the end of that. Um, but I think I'm probably, you know, 45 seems like a nice amount. Um, gives me time in my day to do other things. Um, and, uh, but I, I had this realization the other week that if I want to earn more money in a given year, it's not enough to just book work further out in advance because, um, because that's not actually more money coming in over a given year. That's just work in advance. Um, and so I made the conscious effort uh, about a month or two ago to actually increase the amount I was asking of myself in terms of how much time I was spending on carving per day. And, uh, and the way I went about doing it was I gave myself a, a, um, a target of amount of product that I wanted to make in terms of the amount that I would earn from it. And I had been charging like 40 to 75 dollars 75 would be a big day um and uh, i'll get to your question when it would in just a second and, and instead i realized that if i wanted to earn more at this per year i needed to do you know a hundred dollars a day of stuff and so i just started scheduling that out like that and seeing what that looked like and realizing that i was kind of naturally going there anyways and now it's more common for me to hit $120 a day. And that's without raising prices. So that's just increasing production. I, I plan to increase my prices in October. It's just when it works out well for me to do it. Um, but it's, you know, the work is there. So it's just a matter of no one's going to make me do it any faster than, than me. So I had this realization that I, if I wanted to earn more of a living doing this, I needed to step up to the plate. Um, and part of it, yeah, is, is doing what I didn't think was possible before. You know, if you'd told me this time last year that I was going to make 45 blanks in a day and have it, you know, only be 
four or five hours of work, I would have said no way. Um, all right, so how green is the cherry? Um, the cherry is was came down in a tornado just behind the house, right up here. I'm looking at it. Uh, last um, last February, so not this winter, but the but the previous winter. So it's been sitting around in log form for a little over a year, but they're such big trees that um, that they are. Uh, it's still it's still fairly green. I can feel moisture within it, but cherry is very forgiving. Um, one of the things I love about it is that you can carve it fairly green, and it just doesn't care. It'll still give you a nice clean knife finish. Um, and to answer the question of uh, is that Fiona? Fiona, I, I sell blanks just through Instagram. People reach out if you are interested in spoon blanks. They're they're three dollars each. I do two types. I do ones that are basically like this called raw blanks where if I trimmed it here and trimmed it here then you would get it and you would do all the remaining axe work some people like that I also sell ones that are more you know like this that are ha what I would take inside and start carving or carve outside it's nice now um, I call those finished blanks and I do whatever shapes I normally do cooking spoons eating spoons scoops a lot of times people Order them by the flat rate box if you're in the U.S. Oh, yeah, and I only sell to the U.S. and Canada because of international laws about that. Um, and really the most, the only efficient way to do it is to uh, just order whatever fits into a flat rate box, which is usually about 15. And the flat rate box um, costs about $15 to ship within the U.S. And... Uh, so you get about $45 worth, $15 of shipping, $60 total, and you end up with, uh, you know, 15 blanks of, of various sorts. Some people ask for just straight up billets of wood. Um, so yeah, if that's something anybody is interested in, I'm currently booking work in the middle of July. Um, but it all happens through my Instagram page, or you can send me an email. Um, Either one works fine, and uh, and it's almost it's it's almost always a mixture of birch and cherry, because that's what I have a lot of. So one thing I'm looking at here is the grain on this piece, kind of dips into the handle, and I bet that if I were to go split it here, it would dip in and actually split out the handle the way I want. So you do have to be paying attention to where the grain goes. Now, the grain back here. See this line of green goes right down here, right down the center. So in this instance, I would actually use that popping the wood free technique for the entire length of the handle, which is more work, but in a situation like that where I'm pretty sure it, it wouldn't do a split well, um, you know, it doesn't take really that much longer to do it that way. And it has a lot more assurance that it's not going to go wrong and leave you having spent all this time on this beautiful piece of wood without it working out. So. But to go back to the blanks, um, you know, probably the most common order for blanks right now is when people say just give me a mix which is what I'm doing now you know a little of this a little of that different shapes people can try out a lot of the sort of shapes that I carve and a lot of times people make them their own completely sometimes people are using them to try and figure out what it is that I'm doing either way is fine I'm always happy and flattered when people try and carve stuff that I tend to carve um, and I carve it for a reason and that I think is just you know easy to carve and works well So when I'm splitting the back corner here, I'm usually lined up right with the neck and then I'm making sure that I'm staying away from that front edge there. So just like that. And then I can get closer to that front edge with a more controlled curving cut like that. 
Now, because this doesn't have any wrap around, I didn't get close to that tip the way I do on things that have a more rounded tip, right? So you have to pay attention to that. It's not the same as doing a round spoon. You're actually creating the finished rim dynamic there. Okay. And uh, just one further thought on the blanks. You know, a lot of I didn't really understand when I started making blanks who was going to buy them. And I thought, you know, gosh, why didn't why don't people make blanks themselves? But a lot of times it's people who live in cities who don't have access to the abundance of beautiful wood that I have right on my doorstep. And so it's a way for me to share that with them because there's uh, some real pleasure that can come from carving you know, wood from big trees that it's free of knots. It's it's just a different experience. And so if you're living in a city and you've been scavenging branches, you can buy blanks from me and, you know, have that different experience for just a couple bucks, which I've come to realize is, is the whole point. Okay, so then I have this piece, which I thought I was going to do... Uh, two eaters on but looking at it now I can see that um, looking at it now I can see that uh, it'd be a little short for that so I'll probably do um, one pocket spoon which tend to be about an inch shorter for me and one regular eater and that way I can make the most out of this beautiful piece of wood. So I'll do the pocket spoon on this part of things. Now the pocket spoon has been an interesting progression for me. I originally thought of the pocket spoon as being something that was short because I thought you know, you're gonna put it in your pocket. And then I realized after I made a bunch of short ones that really whether it's short or long, you know, whether it's an inch difference is not gonna make the difference in whether you put it in your pocket. What really matters is how strong you intuitively feel like it is, whether you feel like it can survive being in your pocket. So you can see I'm actually doing back-to-back -back spoons here. So I'm coming in right at the crest of this one. That way I'll, the, the two bowls will be right up against each other. I'll just be able to saw it in half. Um, so I came up with my current pocket spoon design, uh, I call a Y-Wing Bomber because it kind of looks like the Y-Wing Bomber in Star Wars. Uh, basically because I realized that the, the main thing was having the neck be wide and then uh, I didn't see any reason to I rather like the look of having the, the handle just remain wide all the way down rather than have it taper. It, it, I actually prefer the way it feels in my hand too. Um, so And what I realize is that, you know, what I think of as a pocket spoon is like, really, it's the spoon that you're willing to take with you, toss it in the car, in the truck. It's the spoon you'll take with you um, anywhere because it feels strong enough to not be too delicate. And the, the most delicate part of any spoon is the neck. And so by making the neck as wide as the widest part of the bowl, you just you eliminate that, that weakness, essentially. Um, so that's been really nice. Now, when you don't have those shoulders, when the neck is as wide as the bowl, I've actually found it makes it makes carving a, a sweet curve to the inside of the bowl extremely tricky. Um, so even though in many ways this style of spoon is simpler to carve than other spoons because there's no neck on the outside in terms of being able to visualize what what works and what doesn't work on them they can be actually trickier um, because when you're carving this you don't have the shoulder on the outside to then match the inside curve to you just have to be able to see it um, you know or 
see it well enough to, to draw it with your pencil again. I used to draw all sorts of different bowl shapes and stuff, and then I felt like felt like the creative constraint of drawing what essentially looks from the top view as almost the same spoon over and over again has made me focus on the nuances of what what works and what doesn't work in a way that I wasn't really I was jumping around too fast before to really get in on that. So I feel like I have a much deeper understanding now of exactly what dimensions feel good in your mouth in all three dimensions um, than I did before. Uh, and I can produce those more reliably. I suspect, just judging by the number of blinks I've made, because I don't have another clock on me, we're, uh, we're winding down the time that I might be done. So uh, since there's... Hi, Clint. Uh, Clint is uh, my best friend growing up um, through elementary school. We grew up down the road from each other. Uh, so... Uh, because we only have a few more minutes, if anyone has any questions before this thing automatically logs off, please feel free to lob them at me. With the, uh, with the pocket spoons, oh yeah, do I source the wood myself? I do, yeah, it all comes from the slope right up there um, and I'm due tomorrow to take the chainsaw over to the neighbor's house where most of these trees are down and they very generously said that I could have whatever I wanted to have because um, they have about four acres of trees down and among those four acres are seven or eight beautiful cherry trees so I'm just starting with the ones that are the easiest pickings and I'll get back to the ones that are harder later on so with these pocket spoons, I tend to do that face on the tip of the bowl first, and then I get closer to the rim by knocking the side bits off, so it's roughly in thirds. And then I'll do a similar thing on the back of the handle. And I've realized that this handle, because this handle is so wide, it can also be nice and thin. Not delicate per se, but thinner than you think. Um, certainly not as deep as a keel because it's so wide. Um, so I can get it that way quite a ways. Voila! That's a pocket spoon blank right there. Here's one where it was a little far away in the front, but because of the angle of the, the split that I was making, it went right up to that in the back um, and didn't go over, so I didn't get a split out. But that's the sort of thing that you, you live a bit on the edge when you split off the sides of your spoons like this. But boy, it really does speed up the process and reduces wear and tear on my body, which in the end is the bigger constraint than just wood. Wood for me is easy. Okay. 